I remember graduating college in 2011 and getting prepared for my pro day, that's football. And I had a teammate from high school, went to a nearby college, he's at the next level, he's with the Carolina Panthers. And he calls me and he's like, Marv, hey man, I want you to forgive me for some things that we did in college, in high school, since we met. And I'm like, forgive you? Forgive you for what? Well, the things that we participated in, it caused both of us to sin. And in sin, there's a separation from God. And I'm like, man, I'm not trying to have the, the God moment right now. I'm trying to focus on where I'm trying to get to. And in a sense, he was an idol where I was trying to get to. And I, the Lord allowed this man to speak into my life. He'd later become my best man. But his question to me of, do you just expect God to bless you as you live in sin? It gripped me. Before Christ, I was full of lust and anger and uh, just lost. Apart from Jesus, I was enslaved to fear, control, and codependency in my relationships. I was angry and bitter. I lived in fear of going to hell. I was controlled by shame. I was a slave to fear. My identity was in man. I was an ineffective husband. Because of Jesus, um, I know I am loved and valued exactly as I am. I'm redeemed. He gave me joy. I have peace with God. I now purpose to give my life away. He changed me. Christ changed me. Jesus transformed me. Good morning, City Bridge. Good morning. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. I am so glad to be here with you this morning. I'm thrilled and I'm humbled. And when I mean I'm humbled, I mean that. And it makes me think about the story of the Texas rancher that went to Europe. You may have heard it, you may not know it, but the Texas rancher who was in Europe, he was looking for a fellow rancher to talk to about his farm. And as he got there, he found this rancher and he asked the question, hey, Mr. European rancher, how big is your ranch? The European rancher responded and said, well, you know, I got about 100 acres, so I'm doing okay. What he didn't know is he fell in that Texas rancher's trap. That Texas rancher responded and said, well, the European rancher asked him, how big is your ranch? Texas rancher goes, ah, well, it goes a little something like this. When it comes to my ranch, as the sun is rising up and I hop in my truck and start it up, I drive alongside my ranch and by the time the sun sets, I still haven't even reached the end of my property. The RMP and rancher responded and said, wow, I remember when I had a truck like that. <laughs> Unlike the Texas rancher, I am humbled to be here with you this morning, City Bridge. Uh, and I could not be here without my bride, Amber Walker, who's sitting right over here. I praise God for her. Nine years, six months, and nine days today, I married that girl. She is the dressing to my salad. Without her, my life would be dry. Come on, somebody. Yes, that is her. We have three children, five, four, and two. And whew, you might pray during this time for me to bring the word, but when I leave here, that's when I need you to pray for me. Because we are in the woods, there's a lot going on, the house is loud, it's fun. Uh, being a father is a joy, uh, it's a gift to walk uh, alongside my helpmate and do this. Uh, Mia Grace, Nehemiah Ellis, Ivy Rain, our three kids uh, are, a, are a joy, they're a blast. But before the kids, before the marriage uh, came my story, and just to give you a little snippet before I bring the word, it was 11 years ago that I got to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness. I remember graduating college in 2011 and getting prepared for my pro day, that's football. And I had a teammate from high school, went to a nearby college. He's at the next level. He's with the Carolina Panthers. And he calls me and he's like, Marv, hey man, I want you to forgive me for some things that we did in college, in high school, since we met. I'm like, forgive you? Forgive you for what? Well, the things that we participated in, it caused both of us to sin. And in sin, there's a separation from God. And I'm like, man, I'm not trying to have the, the God moment right now. I'm trying to focus on where I'm trying to get to. And in a sense, he was an idol where I was trying to get to. And I, the 
The Lord allowed this man to speak into my life. He'd later become my best man. But his question to me of, do you just expect God to bless you as you live in sin? It gripped me. And from that, he, da- he asked me to download the Bible app, open to the book of John. We walk through the gospel, and I have just experienced the grace of God and don't deserve any bit of it at all. That's a little bit of my story. I know you're not here for that, but uh, as your pastor mentioned, Watermark South Dallas, that is where I've been at the last two and a half years. And Watermark South Dallas is located uh, in South Dallas, obviously, uh, right next to the fair and in Fair Park, where we have planted and our doors open June 20th of 2021. Uh, It has been a blast. It has been stretching. God has been teaching me and our team a whole lot in the last two and a half years in that community. Understanding where we come from Watermark, Watermark is a predominantly white body planted in a predominantly black community that is becoming Hispanic. So all of that in this blended body is what's going on in South Dallas as we gather at 3 p.m. every Sunday. So after this, y'all know where I'm heading. Uh, But that's what's going on. But with that, this community is averaging $24,000 per household. I say that just so you can get a context of what's going on where we are. And with that, 70% of the kids that have been coming in for the last two and a half years are coming without parents. So that makes a heavy lift for our new excuse me, our new members, the body, uh, volunteers. It's a lot to pull off a service, but it is a blast. The gospel is shared. Jesus is seen. That is who I am, where I'm at now. And lastly, your leaders here at City Bridge. Praise God for them. Can, you, can, can we? Your leaders, your church, all that's going on. I have a lot of love for them, truly. And we sat down, Kyle, David, and I had a conversation, broke bread, and we're engaged. And they're like, hey, Marvin, you believe in free speech? I'm like, of course I do. They said, great, come give one. So <laughs> that's why I'm here. That's how I got here. Let's pray and let's get in God's word. Here we go. Heavenly Father, thank you for your faithfulness in our lives, though we don't deserve any bit of it. What we do deserve is death. We thank you, Jesus, for what you took on yourself that we couldn't if we even tried. As the grass withers and as the flower fades, it is your word that lasts forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. There we go. City Bridge, I want you to picture this with me this morning. 1,000 miles miles south of here in Plano, Texas. If you were to drop a pin, if you were to travel 1,000 miles south, where would that land you? Talk back to me. Okay, you're right. Mexico. Not just Mexico. I think I heard somebody say Mexico City, Mexico. And that's where it would land you. That's the capital. Where the language is different. Where the food is different. Where the buildings look different. The whole vibe of everything there is different. And this is not, hear me clearly, a vacation. You're not there to vacate. You have been taken captive. Chains. And you're heading there. You see your friends. You see the people next to you. You see family. But you are a captive heading to another country. There's a story of a group of friends that were captured from their homeland. Heading to Babylon, which is also about a thousand miles where they were from. This king captured them and he wanted everybody to look like him, talk like him, eat like him. This is the story of Daniel. This is a book about exile and Israel was uprooted from everything they knew. This king, Nebuchadnezzar, shows up and conquers them. What he says is, I want the best and the brightest, the top 10%. This is where you don't want to be the top 10% of your class. He said, I want them to serve me. Now, Daniel wrote this book well into his 90s. But this experience in this book was when he was a teenager. So let's get into it. I'm reading out of the NKJV this morning, but as long as you're reading out of the B-I-B-L-E, we're going to be all right. Daniel chapter 1, verse 6 says, Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuch gave names. He gave Daniel the name, Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, 
Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. As soon as this story starts off, we get names and then experience a name change. Just captured, we get the names, then a name change. It's interesting. But that's pretty much the same thing our culture wants to do with us because these dudes in this story had Hebrew roots connected to their names. Their names had meaning about God. And as soon as they show up on the scene in Babylon, a name change occurs. With us, it's the same thing, y'all. The same exact thing is what the culture wants to do with us. Remove God from all that, you're, all that you are, all that you're doing. Just take it away and just change your name to influencer. Just change your name and be focused on supervisor. Or you know what? Climb that ladder to be chief operating officer. Water it down. Don't live so boldly with the gospel. Don't live by faith. Put that stuff away. Cultural Christianity, keep it watered down and just accept me for me. But Daniel and his boys, they weren't with that because they knew decisions determine our destiny. And that's our title today for our time this morning. Decisions determine your destiny, our destiny. So in between this radical generosity series that you've been in and before you kick off Advent, to take a pause to remind myself, you, that our decisions today, whether you are 18 or 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, decisions still matter. And your decisions will determine where you land. For you note takers, the first point in our time is going to be standing through preparation. Let's get back to the text. Daniel 1.8 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel and his three boys made up their minds. They decided they aren't just going to eat and participate with what's easily accessible. They were captives. Remember that. But they still said, no, thank you. They purposed in their heart early on in this story. When we think about the book of Daniel, we think about Daniel 6. That's the den moment. That's the den moment is chapter 6. But what happened in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 that helped them to get to 6? You see here in the first chapter, Daniel purposed in his heart what he was going to do. And we're going to see the decisions that they made along the journey to even get to 6 to see a lion's mouth shut by God. But they said, no, thank you. I don't want to participate in a food, a drink that's offered up to idols because the law wasn't with that. It wasn't what their God would be pleased with. They refused to go along just to get along. And this was their first opportunity in a pagan culture to follow Yahweh, to follow the Lord. This was their first opportunity. Daniel knew if I decide to do this, if I go through with this, it's just a small food decision. It could get me killed. But Daniel, Daniel kept going. With that small decision, he chose to refrain from eating those things, knowing that it would help him overcome some greater things later. Well, what about the small decisions that we could make or have to make today? You know, those small decisions can lead us to greater victories in the future. And when I mean small decisions, I mean small in, in a sense of when you got out of the bed this morning, did you go for your phone or did you go to your knees to just thank God for life, breath, the day? Did you start scrolling to see what the last post you sent and who liked it and what they said? Or did we go to see what he said? The small decisions is what I'm talking about. And I know club sports could be a thing, but is it more important to 
jump into club sports or discipleship and surround this next generation with believing people that are following the Lord. I mean, small decisions in a sense of, do I go for one more drink even though nobody's really watching? And I know I'm leading this team here at work and the culture and the atmosphere that we operate in leads us to really do happy hours. Am I following that trend? I'm talking about the small things this morning. You know, I can remember a time in 2010. In 2010, we were getting ready to play Texas Tech University in football. And I knew we were in for it. 2010, they had a very fast-paced offense. So in this time, we spent time preparing in a way that would help us to be ready for this fast-paced offense. Yeah, we got music going at practice, but everything was much faster time-wise and everything. Running to the next station, but that really didn't help us prepare well. Because I can remember getting to Lubbock, Texas, and it was game time, and I feel like I got slapped in the face. Because I was watching the referee dig up the ball and place it down and the next snap came and the next snap came and you would think as a defensive back, that's the position I played, playing against an offense that throws the ball 50 times, it would be great. Football. But I can remember a specific play where in that back pedal, I went up, the ball tipped my hands and praise God it wasn't for a touchdown. It was for a first down. But that happened because I got lazy. I got lazy in my stance and I just got tired because everything was moving so fast. And I share that story because a lot of us have gotten lazy as followers. We've gotten lazy in our stance as Christians. We've gotten lazy in the way we pursue God's word. We've gotten lazy in the way we open up the word. We've gotten lazy in our friendships. We've gotten lazy in the way we steward our body. We've gotten lazy in the way we approach the throne room. We've gotten lazy and it's not okay to be lazy in your friendships, to be lazy in your marriage. Let's keep reading. Daniel 1, 9 continues the story saying, now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my Lord of the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. And let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you. And the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. Last verse. And at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. They stood through preparation. God granted them favor as they took a stand, not engaging nor indulging in the practices of the culture. See that. Decisions still determine our destiny. And in this standing through preparation, as we look at, just kind of breeze through chapter two, King Nebuchadnezzar is in this moment as the king of Babylon has a dream and he wants to know what it means so badly that he's like, I'm not telling you what I dreamt about, all you astrologers, magicians, everybody in the king's court, I want you to tell me what I dreamt about. And if you don't tell me, all of y'all are dead. That's chapter two. Daniel, chapter one, verse 17, says that he's been given the gift to tell and interpret dreams. So he breaks the dream down. Daniel 2.28 mentions that God is the one who reveals. So he gives Daniel this gift and Daniel walks the king through everything he dreamt and exactly what it meant. And what's the king do in chapter two? He falls before Daniel and he's like, Dan, you the man, you know what? Offer up some incense to this dude's God. We got it going on. He's feeling himself so much that in chapter three, as Daniel's elevated immediate promotion into the king's court, he builds a 90 foot statue, gold of himself. And he wants everybody to bow 
down to it. I'm about to play some music, he says, and when the music goes, everybody in the land bow. Now let's jump to Daniel 3.11. Daniel 3.11, as you're in your Bible apps or your Bible, it says, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Woo-wee! It just got real. It got real fast. My question, as we just read this moment and picture ourselves in here, what is it that you can start now that'll help you stand later? What is it that you can stop now that'll help you stand longer? What is it? I mean, is, is bowing in prayer, just getting on your knees, is that a difficult thing for you? Maybe it's that. How often do you pray over your family and over your children? How often does that take place? You know, personally, as a father, the most challenging thing right now for me that's speaking to me and hitting me in the chest often is Ephesians 6, 4, the verse that's talking about not provoking your children to anger. And as you can tell, I get excited. I get a little loud. And when I do that with my kids, it can provoke them. But that verse is helping me to stand and come at them with gentleness. This is all about standing in preparation. For the second point, we got standing through preparation. Now standing through application. All the instruments are about to play. The three Hebrew boys get their second chance and the king is saying, you better bow. And then we get to Daniel 3.16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. And they were saying this without arrogance. They were simply admitting that they were guilty. Though Nebuchadnezzar employed them, they understood that we serve. We serve the Ancient of Days. We serve the Lord Almighty, and that's who we're standing by and with. I want you to picture a a can of spray paint. When it comes to spray paint, in order to make a difference and for you to see the effect, you have to apply it. It doesn't make a difference if you don't apply it. If you don't apply it, there's no change. If there's no there's no change. But it's the application and applying when the difference is made. They stood through application. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah applied their faith in this situation. We'll never make a difference if we don't live different. We'll never make a difference. And God calls us to apply in every situation. After we read, every time it's about making the application to change the surface that God has called us to. All four of these guys in this story throughout, they maintain their distinctions as God's people in a place where the culture wanted them to just do the opposite. Do what we tell you. But they had decided far in advance for the possibility of this day. They knew decisions determine our destiny. From the stance that they took, we can learn how to be set apart in our culture, in Plano, in Richardson, wherever you live in Dallas today. Daniel 3 17 says, if, it's, if that is the case, this is their continued response. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand. 
they decided to fear God more than a furnace. Furnace is a fearful thing, getting thrown in there. But they decided to fear God far more than a furnace. And they said, you know what? We prefer death over unfaithfulness. That's our preference. And that's what they stood by. This is standing through application. I remember the beginning of this story when I said you, the people next to you, your family, your loved ones, everybody's heading to Mexico City. Now, this is all of God's people that were now heading towards Babylon. Not just some, it wasn't just them four, but the three, because Daniel's in the court of the king, were caught standing. The king couldn't see out of all those thousands upon thousands of people, so his men had to bring those three, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to the king. Follow me. All of God's people were taken. When the music played, when that king hit that boombox, everybody's knees went here. Except three of God's people. So be cautious when you read this story and connecting it to yourself saying, ha, I would have been right there standing tall, baby. Be cautious because thousands of the people of God's knees were bent to an idol except for three. And I want you to take that in. Why? Because we'll associate ourselves with the main character, but yet still today, we bow to pornography. We bow to things that God doesn't call us to that are idols of today. We, even as students in this room, we bow to grades. And we associate ourselves with A's and B's more than what's written from Genesis to Revelation. Because our identity is here, not in a progress report or report card. Those things are good, but not when it comes to your identity. Oftentimes, fellas, we bow to a golf course. And we just are so closely connected to do a tea time in our downtime. Maybe it's adding to the bank account that you're bowing to. Instead of adding to the disciples, instead of adding to the kingdom, more disciples. Maybe that's it. Some of us even bow to the, you know what, I just want picture perfect kids. Just want them to be good, look good, do good. And you've created this standard in your household that God hasn't called you to. We got to be cautious of how we're bending our knees, what we're bowing to. Satan is crafty. What decision is it that you can make today that looks more like standing than bowing? Take that in for a minute. What is a decision that you can make today that looks more like I'm going to stand tall for the kingdom of God? I'm not going to bow to this situation that I know is bound to come up during my work week when I get weak, how can you look more like I'm standing up than bowing down? There's a true story of a young man by the name of Danny Simpson. Danny lived in Ottawa, Canada. As Danny lived in Ottawa, Canada as a young dude, he was was a little money hungry. And Danny had inherited a 45 caliber pistol from his father. Being money hungry, he got the idea, I want to rob a bank. It's a true story. And as Danny went to rob this bank with this pistol, he made out with $6,000 cash. The first mistake Danny made was he wanted to rob a bank. Second, he did it armed. In this situation... What Danny did not understand was the gun that he took after he was arrested and caught by the tape. The gun that he did it with was a rare 1918 handgun worth $100,000. Come on, Danny! But Danny didn't understand what was in his hands. 
Danny didn't understand the value of what was right there. Do we, do you understand the value of who you behold? What's your heirs to? The title of a child of God that you have on your name, do you really understand that? And I don't think we do because we chase titles. In relationships, we chase titles in the work environment. You are far more valuable than a rare 1918 handgun in the sight of Jesus Christ, the Lord. We, oftentimes we look at other people's lives and we think, man, their lives are just fire, pun intended in this moment. What they have, what they do, what they, what they, Going back to Danny Simpson, it's all about the next decision that you will make. It's not about others. Your decisions determine your destiny. We have riches in Christ. So much value. But instead, we just constantly are bowing to whether it be exercise, your habits, your hobbies. But if nothing, nothing should be done more than being with God and in his word. That's why I enjoyed that still moment before we transitioned. And let's be cautious of how we bow our knees to the next vacation. And we look forward to that more than Christ's return. That ought to never be the case. But we talk about it. Oh, we get excited about it and we build it up. But you know the last words are, somebody's coming quickly. Daniel 3.18 says, But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. Why? He rose in haste and he spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king, that's interpretation. Yeah, you're right. Look, look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. He had to be peeking into this furnace, squinting, shocked, because we threw three, but I see four, and the fourth looks like, church, hear me. When you stand like this, you get a standing ovation from the one who extends salvation to us. The pre-incarnate Christ showed up in the Old Testament on these fellows' behalf because of how they stood. Because of how they stood. You gotta get excited about that. And it happened back in chapter one. How you stand in the culture determines how the Lord is gonna show up in your fiery furnace moments. How you stand in today's culture when we go out those doors, it's going to determine how the Lord shows up in your furnace moments. And guess what? We're promised furnace moments. We are promised troubles. You're like, that's not one of the promises of God. It is. But you see the Lord show up in the midst of a fiery trial. And God received glory 
because of how they stood. That's standing through application. And the last one is standing through dedication. You know, sometimes, sometimes God does pull you out of the fire, but sometimes he leaves you in it. Sometimes he leaves you in it. But those first three words of verse 18, but if not, we have to understand that in our faith, the one true living God may not show up in every circumstance. And they understood that. God's people were ready to die in this moment because of what they believed. They preferred, again, death over being unfaithful. But because decisions determine destiny, they were prepared from how they were standing back in chapter one. Sometimes we pray prayers like, God, don't give me a hard time. Don't just make this difficult. And you know what? Sometimes he does that, but sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he doesn't do that, but you better believe, just like in this story, the Lord can show up in the middle of your circumstances, in the middle of your trials, in the middle of a fiery moment, he can show up. How are you standing? How are you standing? Last section of verses, Daniel chapter three, verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace. And he spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administers, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any God except their own God. Last verse, therefore I make a decree that any people nation or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, insert your name there, shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made in ash sheep because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Faith is a muscle. Faith is a muscle in this situation. If you don't use it, it's going to atrophy. It's gonna shrink up if you don't use it. But the more you use it, the stronger it gets. I mean, these dudes, since the opening chapter, were dedicated to take steps of faith before the furnace even showed up. Before the furnace even happened, they were flexing that muscle of faith. They were taking steps of faith. They were choosing to stand. They flexed by trusting. They flexed by remembering that every decision that we make determines our destiny. But some of us avoid fires. And we'll run from fires. We'll ask God to help us in the fires and take the fires away. Probably because of the, the atrophy. But you know what? We can still ask God for a faithful next opportunity to give us another chance to flex that muscle of faith. But when you ask that question, be ready for the heat because it'll probably get hot. Jesus Christ is alive and well, and he can show up in the midst of the fires, the floods. The bigger question is, are you really going to stand for his name when he sets you up and puts you in that opportunity? Church, obedient, obedience is worth it. As you read this story, obedience is worth it. And when we're obedient, you know what? It can change somebody else's future. Here we are, November 26th, the year of our Lord, 2023, reading about a story of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah thousands of years ago. But they're affecting us today. Those dudes weren't thinking about y'all or me then. But it's affecting us. How you stand later today, tonight, this week, leading up to Christmas, it can and will affect somebody else's future. You might say, I get that this is the book of Daniel. I, mean, I see that these 
guys stood strong, or whether you're a Daniel or a Daniela, it doesn't matter. What matters is what decisions we're going to make because it will affect our destiny tomorrow. Decisions will always determine our destiny. It's worth it to stand through the preparation. It's worth it to stand through the application. It's worth it to stand through the dedication. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ is God can meet you in the fire. God can save you from you and save me from me. But the greatest thing about the gospel is that God can save us from the fires of hell. God has when you trust in him. Now, this isn't about a God that has sent us to hell. I've heard that question before. Hell is a direction that all of us are heading born into sin in a broken world. We're heading towards hell, but the finished work on the cross, Jesus Christ says, let me have him. Let me have her. Because they put their trust in the son of the living God. And I stepped in, in their place. When you trust in Jesus, eternity is spent with him. But we have that option. If you haven't chose Jesus, that option is on you. It's not about riding the coattail of grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, so-and-so that you heard about, you have a choice to place trust and faith in Jesus. The ultimate saving is done through him. See, the fire that the Hebrew boys went into, they were saved from that situation. It, It may not be the same for us. It may not be the same. I'm hoping that Daniel's chapter one, two, and three in our time this morning has built you up to really take a stand more than you bow. Also, just knowing that just Thanksgiving being a few days ago, there's people that are in the middle of fiery situations, whether it be your marriage, whether it be your entire family, where it's just hard. But maybe there's some people here that just need to make a decision. Hey, I need to jump in with Jesus because I'm kind of hot and cold. Maybe there's some people that just need to make a decision to repent and turn from how they've been bowing. Turn to God. There's going to be an opportunity for you to be prayed for and for you to really take a stand. But in this moment, City Bridge, your decisions matter. Your decisions will still and always determine where you end up, where you land.